All right, I think we're ready to get ready and get started. Um, we're on uh, section five in the lectures on faith. Start off with a prayer. No. Greg, would you mind? <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this beautiful day and a nice, cool morning. I thank you, Father, that we're able to gather here freely and uh, to be able to, to learn and to uh, enlighten our minds and our hearts. I pray, Father, and heaven for your spirit to be with us, that you would guide us in our thoughts and that uh, you would guide us to truth and light and that we would take in this understanding into who we are and into our very beings, Father, that uh, we would conform our ways to your ways so that... Uh, everything that we read and study, that uh, we, we would apply it directly into our lives. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Greg. All right. Uh, before we get started, does anybody need a copy of the lectures? Okay. Anyone else? You didn't have to come up here. I would have... Thanks, Barbara. Anyone else? I think I have one copy left. Nope. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, we've been uh, studying Lecture 5 for about, well, it's the third week now. And uh, in this lecture, <clears throat> just a reminder, and for those who haven't been able to make it, this lecture uh, speaks of the Godhead. And, of course, the Godhead is uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, and this lecture d defines exactly what the Godhead or how the Godhead is is made up. Okay, uh, remember uh, just really quick. There's there's three theories, three uh, ideals, ideas on how the Godhead's made up. The first one is that that it's it's God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost all in one being. Um, again, I think that's pretty easy to to show through the scriptures and uh, through other testimonies that that one's not viable whatsoever. Um, you know, just for instance, when, when Christ was praying, who was he praying to? You know, was he praying to himself or was he praying to a father in heaven? Who did he teach his disciples to pray to? And he taught him to pray to your father who is in heaven, present tense. So therefore it couldn't have been, you know, uh, him. Uh, what did Joseph see in the grove? Two persons just, okay. Okay, the, uh, the second, second idea is that uh, uh, it's a trinity. They're all three personages of some sort. Um, and, and the lecture goes through here. It talks about the Father being a personage of spirit, glory, power, possessing all perfection, fullness, the Son uh, as a personage of tabernacle, and so on and so forth. And then the trinity ideal uh, says that the Holy Ghost is, is a personage of something, spirit, whatever. And then we have the correct understanding, which is, is given here in the lectures, that there are two personages, the Father and the Son, that the Holy Ghost is the, the, the mind, power, will, uh, or the mind, will, and power, I guess, would, might be an easier way to, to think about it, of the Father and the Son, okay? So uh, we don't fit in with, <laughs> I, I should say, the Latter-day Saints' uh, understanding of, of the Godhead does not fit in with either of the world's understandings. So this is very unique to our understanding, okay, and what was revealed to Joseph here. All right, does anybody have any questions or comments on that before we get started? Okay, so we're on to uh, paragraph two, and uh, we have just finished up talking about the Father and the Son and, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit as, as it's stated in here, and how they fit together. And so we're on to 2L here. So if we have a volunteer to read 2L through S. It'll be page 74 if you have the black book. Uh, down toward the bottom is 2L, and then through through the rest of 2. Greg? Sure. <clears throat> I'll wait for everybody to turn if everybody's already there. Okay. And these three are one, or in other words, these three constitute the great matchless governing and supreme power over all things, by whom all things were created and made, that were created and made. And these three constitute the Godhead, and are one, the Father and the Son possessing the same mind, the same wisdom, glory, power, and fullness, filling all in all, the Son being filled with the fullness of the mind, glory, and power, or in other words, the spirit, glory, and power of the Father, possessing all knowledge and glory, and the same kingdom, sitting at the right hand of power, 
in the express image and likeness of the Father, a mediator for man, being filled with the fullness of the mind of the Father, or in other words, the Spirit of the Father, which Spirit is shed forth upon all who believe on his name and keep his commandments. And all those who keep his commandments shall grow up from grace to grace and become heirs of the heavenly kingdom and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, possessing the same mind, being transformed into the same image or likeness, even the express image of him who fills all in all, being filled with the fullness of his glory and, be, and become one in him, even as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. Okay. Uh, this passage in here I think is very beautiful and holds incredible promise. Okay, uh, so just to start with L, 2L there, these three are one, or in other words, these three constitute the great matchless governing, governing and supreme power over all things. Okay, they are one in focus, they are one in mind, they are one in heart. Okay, they are one heart and one mind. And when it comes to, to, to the, the governing, the, the, the creation, the governing of of us, you know, of, of this world, and of course every other world that, that uh, they have created and governed. All right? On to 2M, these three constitute the Godhead. Okay? So they are three in one. God is one idea, but it's three entities with, with three separate functions, but they all function together. Okay? It's, it's kind of difficult to wrap your mind around, at least for me it is. Okay? Um, and then on to O, <clears throat> and uh, about halfway through O, uh, where it starts with being filled with the fullness of the mind, uh, I find this to be incredible promise and an incredible um, uh, challenge for, for us. And it states, being filled with the fullness of the mind of the Father, in other words, the Spirit of the Father, pardon me, which Spirit is shed forth upon all who believe on His name and keep His commandments. Okay? So, that Spirit... The you know, Spirit of the Father, the Holy Ghost, the mind, will, and power of the Father and the Son is shed forth upon all who believe on His name and keep His commandments. And that and is very important there. Okay? Because remember, there are a lot of denominations, and I'm not running them down, but there are a lot of denominations that think all I have to do is confess His name and say I believe on Jesus Christ and I'm saved. And keep His commandments. Okay? There's an and there, and we must do that. For how can we truly believe in Christ if we are not willing to keep His commandments? Does that make sense? Okay. And then going on from there, to Q, and all those who keep His commandments shall grow from grace to grace, and we are promised that in other, other scriptures, okay, and become heirs of the heavenly kingdom, we are promised that, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Now, why would Jesus Christ be an heir to the heavenly kingdom? Any ideas? I think it's pretty simple, personally, because he's a son who did what? Came down to earth and lived a human life, right? Okay, so he was our example, and this is saying that we can be like him. Not part of the Godhead, of course, but we can be just like him and be joint heirs as Christ or with Jesus Christ to the heavenly kingdom. Okay? What an incredible promise. You know, I, I wouldn't say we could be on par, but if you could take a word that means just a little less than on par, or words that mean just a little less than on par with Jesus Christ, that, that's where we can be. Does that make sense? Okay? Okay. So that puts a heavy burden on our shoulders, doesn't it? That really lays a weight that, that we can't just go from day to day and day to day and do what we want to do and expect to inherit celestial glory or be heirs of the heavenly kingdom. That means we have to live like Jesus Christ in order to, to inherit that kingdom. You know, yes, we're going to fail, you know, and, but that's not an excuse. We pick ourselves up and we try, and that's what repentance is all about, right? Okay, not a one and done. It's a continual changing of our lives to emulate Jesus Christ and keep his commandments, all right? So going on to our... Possessing the same mind, being transformed in the same image or likeness. And it's speaking back with Jesus Christ. Being transformed in the same image or likeness, even the express image of Him who fills all in all. Just as Christ, uh, well, going back to the, the New Testament, Christ says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Okay, This is where we are striving to be and should be striving to be. 
when people see us, they should be able to see the Father. Not because we're part of the Godhead, but because we're emulating Jesus Christ and emulating that will or following that will and keeping the commandments of God, the Father. Okay? And that is what this is trying to teach us here. Being filled with the fullness of His glory and become one in Him, even as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. Even as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. That's how we are supposed to strive to be. So, yes, we are just that, Greg. So, we, we obviously were not going to become Jesus Christ, okay? But we have that promise that we can be basically on the same level with Him, being one with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we have to grow from grace to grace. And how do we do that? We have to keep His commandments. And how do we do that? We have to be in the Scriptures learning those commandments and on our knees praying and seeking the help of the Holy Ghost to direct us and guide us in that. Right, I think it was last week I talked about, I, I've always viewed, since I actually came, you know, got, got into the church, uh, my view on a conscience became different and it became more of, that's the Holy Ghost pricking, our, pricking us and telling us what we're supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to be living our lives, right? That is our conscience. And I, I don't know if you've noticed, I've noticed this, but when I get on a path where I'm not doing right, that conscience kind of fades. Well, it's the pulling away of the Holy Ghost, okay? And when you're on a, a path, you know, a more righteous path, that conscience really kicks in. So when you see something or, or, or think, man, I'd like to do that, that conscience usually kick in like that and go, ooh, ooh, well, I can't do that, I shouldn't do that, yada, 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 okay? And then we've got to be careful not to choose to do it even though our conscience tells us not to. Because that's not a good thing. Um, and I've been guilty of that a number of times. And I, I would guess that most of us have been. But this is what we're striving for. For striving for celestial glory. This is the, the emulation we're trying to emulate to become like Jesus. And to become uh, uh, being filled uh, with that glory. Uh, and become one in Him even as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. That's the definition of one heart, being of one heart and one mind, okay, with the Father. I think that needs to be added on there. All right, Greg? Okay. Uh, just a couple of scriptures to just kind of back up, sure. you know, what's, what's in here. Alma chapter 3, verse, starting with verse 27, it says, And now behold, I ask of you, my brethren of the church, have ye spiritually been born of God? Have ye received his image in your countenance? Have ye experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Do you... Do ye exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we go back to the New Testament, Romans 12, uh, start just verse 1 and 2 real quick. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. And um, I, I, I think it's, it, it basically backs up everything in here. And the, and the reason I, I stress that is because there are still some that, that just do not accept this, these lectures on, on faith as being, well, accurate, but it is perfect. Um, and I forgot where I was going with that other than to back that up. I'll raise my hand if, if I remember where, okay. where, where I was going. No, those are good. Thank you very much. In, in fact, uh, that first one, Alma, uh, uh, talking to ha have has have you your inner self been changed and into that image? I, I forget right exactly how it was. Do you have? I go ahead. I remember now where go I was ahead. going with that. You my my all... mind's scatterbrained, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it's it's funny because you know you you go throughout you know your life and you at times possess you know the spirit of God or you have the spirit of God within you and then there are times when we sin and we chase it away and we're, we have something else in us another spirit and the, you know as the book of Mormon says you know you whatever spirit you you pass away with that's the spirit you're born into the next world with <clears throat> and so you know whatever whatever spirit you might say is cooking within you or, or, or transforming you or, you know, is your, your guide, your northern star, so to speak, your point of focus. Um, you slowly, bit by bit, change your life according to that spirit that, that's in you. And, you know, if you think about it, like if, whether you're unscrewing a screw or screwing it in, let's say it's a big old long 20-foot long screw and, you're, and you know, uh, you're either screwing it in or you're screwing it out. And, the, and let's say the goal is to get it all the way screwed in and to perfection to get everything tightened down. I know that's kind of an odd odd uh, you know, way to look at it, but 
um, you know, a person has to live in Christ and to, to keep on Christ. It's not enough to, um, like, you know, if Christ wore the parachute, you know, it's not enough to put on the parachute and then take off the parachute, put it on, take it off as you're falling. Because at some point, you know, you know, you're you're going to reach the ground one way or the other. But at some point, you know, as far as determining whether or not you're perfect, growing from grace to grace and growing, um, you know, unto perfection, you know, you've you've really got to allow yourself to be saturated in this and keep it. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've I've left church, and I've I've you know we had a great a great service, you know, and, and uh, you know we've left the service, and I thought, wow, the spirit of God, I can feel it. And I remember there there'd be times when, as a as a natural reaction, I'd get in my vehicle to go away, and my first, which is just it's almost habit, it's like a knee jerk reaction. I just want to push push the button and turn on the radio, but then something stops me, and I just know the moment I turn this on, that spirit's going to be chased out. And and when when it says we got to you know follow the promptings of the spirit, and you know allow this to change our lives, we've got to obey that mind and will of God. Otherwise, we chase it away again, and we're back at square one. Okay, I'll shut yeah, up now. Absolutely, that's absolutely right. And I was going to go in that direction. I remember the parable. Um, I don't know exactly what they. You know, theologians title it, but basically the, this parable that Christ, Christ gave was talking about throwing seed out on the ground. Okay, Some lands on barren ground, nothing takes effect. Of course, that seed is the Word of God, right? It's, it's, it's what uh, we're trying to teach each other and what we're trying to teach others we come into contact with. Some throws on, it throws, gets thrown out and it lands on barren ground. Okay, Unfortunately, I think that's, from, at least from what I'm viewing, that's going to be the majority of the world's barren ground. Some gets thrown out and gets thrown on rocky soil. Or rocky ground, and it, it it starts to come up, and uh, depending on the depth of the soil and the rain and nutrients and stuff, it may come up really well for a while, but eventually it all dies off. Okay, and that's you, you see, the, and we see that with with a number of people. I've seen that with with friends of mine and stuff. They get they get excited about something, you know, it's like church. They get excited about church, and they start going for a while, but then other things start tugging at them and pulling at them, and 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 that that uh, excitement whatever uh, uh, wears off and they fade off and back into their old lives or, or the world or even worse sometimes. Um, sometimes they live a little better life but it's not where we're supposed to be. Okay, So we see that the image that, that they tried to take upon them did not, did not stick and their image, their inner image did not change with that. And then you've got the seed that falls on the fertile ground and grows up and produces crops and this and that and the other and that's, that's what we're supposed to be is that crop. Okay, and it can be a struggle. For some people, it's really easy, and they go on and, and whatever. For others, it's really a struggle, and putting your mind to it, and really using some willpower, and going day to day. And but, uh, and we're going to get into in the next section. We're going to get into sacrifice. The next lecture. It's a beautiful lecture on sacrifice. <clears throat> but we're going to get into that in the next one. But that's that's where some people are not willing, and that's where the barren ground or the rocky soil people are. They're not willing to sacrifice things. Uh, to give up the things of this world to inherit the things of the next world, okay? And, uh, you know, just an aside, it, 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 if you can't see a goal, it's hard to really focus on that goal. And uh, we have the scriptures to show us that goal, but we can't visually see it. And so sometimes it's very hard to focus on that goal. And I think that's why a lot of us tend to kind of back off and go forward and back off and go forward from time to time, okay? But if we can get our mind focused totally on God and His glory and come to that, that understanding, almost knowledge or knowledge of what's waiting for us, the stuff around us just won't matter eventually. It just won't matter. Okay? And that's the image that Alma was trying to talk about or was trying to uh, uh, get across to the people he was speaking to. And that's exactly what, what uh, 2 O through uh, S is trying to get through to us here. All right. Anybody else before we move on? Okay, let's go ahead and read uh, 3, uh, A through F, finish it up. Uh, who'd like to read for us? Not everybody at once. I, I can only pick one person. Bonnie, uh, Bonnie, do it. Yeah, Bonnie, if you just finish it off for us. From the foregoing account of the Godhead, which is given in his revelations, the saints have a sure foundation laid, but laid for the exercise of faith 
and to life and salvation. Through the atonement and mediation of Jesus Christ, by whose blood they have a forgiveness of sins and also a sure reward laid up for them in heaven. Even that of partaking of the fullness of the Father and the Son through the Spirit. As the Son partakes of the fullness of the Father through the Spirit, so the saints are by the same Spirit to be partakers of the same fullness to enjoy the same glory. For as the Father and the Son are one, so in like manner the saints are to be one in them through the love of the Father, the mediation of Jesus Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. They are to be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. All right. Thank you, Bonnie. Okay, so uh, this this paragraph here uh, ends it up for us and and takes everything uh, we've just been talking about today and puts it very succinctly and, and very well. So starting with 3D, as the Son partakes of the fullness of the Father through the Spirit. Okay, so picture that. Uh, so the saints are by the same Spirit to be partakers of the same fullness. Okay, again, puts us in the same path as Christ Himself. So we don't have to view him as a separate, unattainable, or being on a separate, unattainable path from us. He walked the same path that we are to walk here on this earth, when he was on this earth. Okay? And uh, again, that doesn't make us like unto him being, being the son of God, but it, makes us, uh, it allows us to become sons of God. And walk on that same path and be partakers by the same spirit, Okay, uh, to enjoy the same glory, for as the Father and Son are one, so in like manner the saints are to be one in them. Okay, we can inherit the same inheritance basically as Jesus Christ inherited. That's what this is trying to get across to us. I think too often we look at at uh, the Father and the Son, and we say that realm, so to speak, in which they live. I know this is, this is, these aren't good words to use specifically, but we, we look at that and say that is totally unattainable to us, but it's not. And that's what the Bible for the Protestant world and the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants and the Lectures on Faith for us, uh, and the Bible, of course, that's what all those scriptures are trying to tell us. That's what all the prophets have been trying to tell us and point us in that direction for 6,000 years. Okay? And that's what is put so, so together so well in this lecture. Okay? We are to be joint heirs with Jesus Christ, as it goes on to say in 3F. Now, they are to be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, we can attain these things through the help of God and in, in, in things. I don't mean to say when I say that, I don't, I'm not saying we can do it by our own strength. It has to be through uh, their leadings, their promptings, and their guidance, and, and their uh, uh, taking the stumbling blocks out of our path uh, as we work to follow the commandments. Okay, the uh, you know the phrase "God helps those who help themselves" is nowhere in the scriptures, of course. But it it, it if we put it uh, if we use that phrase to kind of uh, tie together what I've been trying to say here is if we help ourselves by following the commandments, striving to follow the commandments of Jesus Christ and follow the commandments of God, God will reach down and help us along the way and pull us forward, okay? even in our times of need, especially in our times of need, so long as we are faithful to Him. That makes sense. Okay, so this is a I don't want to call it a burden, but you know, if you look at it, he he allows this burden to be on upon us to try our faith, to uh, um, strengthen our faith, and and make it knowledge, so that we can get over these trials and tribulations, or get through these trials and tribulations that are before us. Okay, uh, questions and comments. That's all we have for lecture five. Nothing? Okay. Well, let's move on to Lecture 6 then. And as I said, in Lecture 6, we're going to be talking about sacrifice. So this rounds out the, um, the uh, I don't want to phrase it. This lecture kind of rounds out what, um, what we've been trying to get to this whole time. 
okay? We're talking about the, the uh, uh, character perfections and attributes of God and also the makeup of the Godhead, okay? This, this understanding or these understandings about the character perfections, attributes, and things, these understandings will allow us to go forth and, and have better understanding of the scriptures and, uh, and, 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 and attain knowledge uh, that, that we can truly invest all of our faith, all of our hope, all of our dreams, everything in God, and not worry about being disappointed in those things. Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, if we could have someone read uh, verse 1 there, paragraph 1, 1A through 1C. Um, yeah, Karen. Took me a second, sorry. <laughs> Things are not firing in all <laughs> cylinders this morning. <laughs> Did you say 1A through C? Through yeah, C. Just, okay. just one there. Yeah. Okay. Having treated in the preceding lectures of the ideas of the character, perfections, and attributes of God, we next proceed to treat of the knowledge which persons must have that the course of life which they pursue is according to the will of God, in order that they may be enabled to exercise faith in Him unto life and salvation. This knowledge applies... I'll go ahead and stop there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that was C, right? Yeah, you were getting into two? Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure because I, I, I was <laughs> stretching my back a little bit. Okay, so 1A there is just an introduction. So we've, we've looked at, as I said, that God's character. And when I say God, I'm talking about the Godhead, of course. His character, perfections, attributes, and of course, it doesn't state it here, but we just got through looking at the makeup of the Godhead. Okay? And then uh, in 1B there, um, we're going to, we, well, let me, before I go into that, we need an understanding of these things. Not just an understanding, we need to, to learn these things and, and, and know these things from the Scriptures, okay? Because that's how He reveals Himself to us, right? Through the Scriptures and then, of course, prayer and, and personal revelation. But we need to know of these characters, perfections, attributes, and the makeup of the Godhead to truly uh, be able to become knowledgeable or have all knowledge uh, of Him, okay, and all knowledge of how he, he acts and will act and react to situations, okay? I know, God knows all, and we say react. It's a human term, so just take it as, as that, because um, I don't think He reacts. We look at it as a reaction because we can't know the future, but He already knows how things are going to go and how He's going to, to, uh, to act in, in that time. Okay. So in this lecture, we're going to, as 2B through C says, proceed to treat of the knowledge which persons must have that the course of life um, which they pursue is according to the will of God in order that they may be enabled to exercise faith in Him unto life and salvation. Okay. So we need to have all this in the past. And then here is the, the thing, the things that we need to do. Keep His commandments is one of them. But uh, we're going to talk about being a... Um, being willing to sacrifice all in this life, okay, in order to inherit celestial glory. So going on from there, uh, we have someone read 2A through C for us. Wayne? Wayne. This knowledge supplies an important place in revealed religion, for it, is by, it was by reason of it that the ancients, ancients were enabled to endure as seeing him who is invisible. An actual knowledge to any person that the course of life which he pursues is according to the will of God is essentially necessary to enable him to have that confidence in God without which no person can obtain eternal life. It was this that enabled the ancient saints to endure all their afflictions and persecutions and to take joyfully the spoiling of their goods, knowing, not believing merely, that they had a more enduring substance. That's from Hebrews uh, 10.34. All right. Thank you, Wayne. Okay. So uh, that last, that last uh, few words there in 2A enabled... Uh, the ancients, of course, is talking, ancient saints, of course, is talking about enabled to endure as seeing him who is invisible. Okay? That's what I was just talking about. Uh, if, we, if we can see a target goal, it's easier for us to, to go toward that goal, right? To move toward that goal. Um, and, and this is what it's seeing. They, they were able to act as if they could see that goal, but that goal is invisible, is, is basically what it's saying. Okay? They couldn't see it, but they were able to have the, the understanding and the knowledge 
in, in God's character attributes and so on and so forth, that they could truly trust in him and truly lay their faith in him. And, and it was as if they were seeing that goal of being of one heart and one mind with him. Make sense? Okay. And then, uh, um, uh, is, so this is an actual knowledge to any person that the course of life in which he pursues is according to the will of God. In order to have that, okay, we have to have that understanding of uh, that God is not a liar, that he, uh, he does not double speak, that he does not respect our persons. You remember all these characteristics and attributes that we talked about? We have to understand that he is going to uh, do the same thing in every situation. That he's never going to tell us to do one thing uh, today, and then and you know, we do it, and then tomorrow he says, "Nope, sorry, that's a sin. I better not do that anymore." Yeah, you know, he's not going to tell us to do that. Now, uh, on a side note, um, somebody might say, "Well, what about the law of Moses?" Well, think about it. Think about the Levitical law, the law of Moses, and you think of what that was for. Okay, you remember the the Israelites? Um, Moses was was uh, told to lead the Israelites out of out of Egypt and up to the mount, and, uh, and God wanted them to come into his presence, okay? just like he wants us to come into his presence. All right? So he was trying to get them to live the celestial law at that point. All right? So um, when, when they wouldn't do that, of course, he gave them another law. And notice I did not say a different law, but it's another law. Okay? And that law was what, what I refer to as the temporal law. I think others have referred to it as that also. Okay, All those things in that law are basically do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. And if we are to follow that law, and I'm not saying we should like Pharisees, but if we were to follow each one of those things that is pointed out, we would be following the celestial law. Realistically, if you think about that. okay, Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not... I don't know what else, you know, you think about a, all, a bunch, all the other things that are in there. Uh, read Leviticus if you, you know, can't get to sleep one night, it'll help, trust me. But, you know, read those things and study them, because they're interesting in, in all those things. But they are, um, they are the things like uh, when Christ says, um, uh, you know, uh, do not commit adultery, okay? Uh, or, or something of like that, because of sin, you know, basically, the, 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 uh, as Paul said, the uh, wages of sin are death. Okay. Well, in the Levitical law, the Mosaic law, of course, if you got caught doing that, you were stoned right then and there. You died. Okay. If if we do that now, we don't repent and and change. What happens? Nothing on this earth, really. But what happens in the afterlife? Come on, somebody give me an answer. I know y'all know. What death? Spiritual death? Exactly. Exactly. Just like when Satan was, was you know, God told Adam and, and Eve in the Garden of Eden, do not eat of the fruit of this tree or you should surely die. What was that death? It wasn't physical death. It was spiritual death. Right? Okay. So same idea. So the, the Mosaic law wasn't a different law. God did not change his mind and implement something different. He was just telling the, the Israelites, okay, you are not going to enter into my presence because I'm pretty ticked off at you. But here are the things that you are going to do or not do. And follow these, okay? And this, and what did it all point to? It pointed to the celestial law, and it all pointed to Jesus Christ, didn't it? Every single one of those things. And when you read through the, the New Testament, and you read through Christ, what he actually taught, you can go back to those, those Mosaic law, and the laws under the temporal law there, and you can say, oh yeah, you know, here's this, here's this, here's this, here's this. You know, not a checklist, but you know what I'm saying, right? It's there. So it all pointed to what he was going to teach to try to bring them up to a much higher level. Okay? So, I don't know how I got off on that. I apologize. But, uh, um, oh, we were talking about different laws. So, God, God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? Now, he may take the celestial law and say, you know, okay, well, you're not willing to follow this, so you're going to follow this. But it's all pointing back up to that celestial law and to Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, I lost where I was there. Okay, so it, it was that knowledge and understanding of and the confidence that they had in God, the ancient saints, is what this is talking about, that enabled them to endure all their afflictions, persecutions, okay, and take joyfully uh, the spoiling of their goods. Knowing, you know, see, parentheses, not merely, or not believing merely, that they had a more enduring substance, okay? Because they had come, become so close with, with God through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, and they had that inner knowledge. Okay, they had the Spirit testifying to them, even though they were being 
murdered or, or harangued or made slaves of. I mean, the Book of Mormon's replete with this stuff, right? I think it was at Alma and Amulek, I don't remember which ones, who uh, were preaching and the, 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 the believers uh, were taken by King Noah. Correct me if I'm wrong on this one, I'm trying to remember back. And they were all being killed, put in the fire, burned. Okay, and one of one of the two said, "Well, let us call down whatever from heaven and 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 stop this." And and the other one says, "No, the spirit restraineth me." Why? Why was that? Because by allowing those those men and women to die, not only were they becoming martyrs, it was trying their faith, but it was also establishing a testimony against those <clears throat> who were murdering them. And those who were murdering them then had basically no way back at that point. Because I personally think they knew what they were doing and why they were doing it. Okay, So that's, uh, that's the point of this. But those people went joyfully <laughs> to their death. I don't know if anybody goes joyfully to their death. But they went joyfully to their death you know, knowing that they had a more enduring substance. They were going to inherit celestial glory because of their faith. And their works, you know, the keeping of the commandments. Okay? Now, I, I don't relish the idea of someone putting me to death, especially in a horrible fashion of burning or crucifixion or something like that. And I don't know how I'd react if I was put up in that situation at this point. Hopefully I would react in the right way. But this is, this is exactly where we are to get to that point where we are willing to give up everything first and foremost. For God and Jesus Christ, okay, Barbara. Yeah, my brother had a testimony once about when he had an operation, and uh, I believe God will take you out of whatever pain or whatever you're in at the moment that He can. Sure. Then you've had enough. And in his case, he they had put him under for an operation, and he could he was paralyzed, but he could still feel every bit of the pain, all of it. Mm -hmm. And so he could do nothing, and it was horrible, obviously. They're cutting into him. But he said at that moment when it just got unbearable, the Lord took him clear out of his body. So we have to know that if we're ever put in a situation to not fear any of that, because God will eventually, he'll take care of us totally. Death is sweet to those that love the Lord. And if we remember that, and, and constantly, because we don't know what's coming in the next few years. And so we need to know that with that confidence of his spirit and his word that we won't have to fear anything because in the end, it won't be unbearable. It'll be whatever we can handle and then he'll pull us out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I forget that, you know, well, obviously, you know, I was just talking. I forget about things like that. And you think about, you know, there's a testimony. And this is why we we're to share our testimonies, you know, with each other, to strengthen each other, to give each other hope. And you think about Stephen being stoned to death, and he didn't complain, but he looked up. He looked up, and he said, "Forgive these, forgive them, for they know not what they do." Same with Christ, you know. And uh, I don't know if Stephen felt the pain of the stones hitting him. He may have, he may not have, but his spirit was in a totally different place, um, you know, uh, on, on a totally different level. Than, than mine is right now, but uh, you know, and, and there are others. Maybe the people with the, that I was just describing the Book of Mormon being put through the fire. Maybe they were in a totally different place, spiritually, you know, on a different level, and so maybe they it didn't hurt them, so to speak. Well, you know, we don't know, okay. But if we always fully rely upon God and Christ, He will be there to to do those things for us. And I'm not talking about being an atheist in a foxhole type of relying upon. I'm talking about you know, even in the good times. Don't forget him, even in the good times. Go ahead, Craig. You know, uh, it, it immediately brings to my mind something that's actually been on my mind for a while, and um, I'll have to kind of keep myself from getting into the sermon today, but, but uh, you know, you go into the New Testament, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, when, when Christ is asking Peter, you know, whom do you say that, that I am, and, and, uh, and Peter immediately says, you know, you're the son of God. And Jesus says, you know, blessed art thou, for, you know, flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven only. And, um, you know, and of course he goes on to say, upon this rock while I built my church, referring to the rock of Revelation. <clears throat> and uh, as human beings, as, as, the, as living under the veil and outside the Garden of Eden, 
we forget how temporary and how small this this life is and I'm probably one of the most guilty but you know just to reference a couple quick stories you know you get second kings chapter 6 when uh, uh, Elisha's uh, he's he's staying in a village or a, I believe it was I believe it was a village or a small town and uh, the king of Assyria sent his horses and, and chariots you know to, to try to surround him and, and uh, Elisha's servant is basically saying, look, you know, we're surrounded. There's no way we can escape this. And Elisha says, don't you know that those who are with us are, are more than those who are against mm-hmm. us? And the servant was like, what are you talking about? So Elisha had to pray to the Lord that, to allow the servant to see. And he saw all the spiritual chariots and all the, all the armies of the Lord, and they were massive. And we, we forget to, all too often that in the end there's this uh, for lack of better words, and maybe I'm wrong for saying that this way, that there's this like this window, or uh, uh, I'm not going to say doorway, but there's, there's there's this window inside of each and every one of us, put inside of us, uh, from the moment that we are put upon this earth. You know, it says that every <clears throat> man and woman is given the spirit of God when they are born into this world, but there's this window that is supposed to be the main thing for each of us to be connected to God, and, you know, and it. It was never supposed to be a, a stone statue. It was never, you know, you, you don't go back and you don't find giant stone statues. The Lord has never, never commanded anybody to create a statue to him or some big monument. You know, he requires a house of prayer and, and you know, and he requires temples. But he requires us to seek him. And that goes back to the, the covenant in Genesis 9, <clears throat> 22. It says, uh, and this is mine everlasting covenant. That when thy poster- posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. And, and that's something that's always, I guess, I guess hit hit me hard every time I read it, is that we have to learn to look upward to Him, mm-hmm. and, and that's just hard because I wake up and what do I see? I see physical, temporal things. Exactly. And uh, you know, it it takes a lot of practice for this. For someone like me, I mean, maybe everyone else is having a good time at this. I, I don't know, but the, well, I mean, but it, 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 this is hard to think about. Yeah, no, I I agree. I'm right there with you on that. Um, anybody else? Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Let's see. That was uh, two. So let's uh, let's do three A through C. We'll do all the three. Who would like to read for us for three? Uh, sure. Having the assurance that they were pursuing a course which was agreeable to the will of God, they were enabled to take not only the spoiling of their goods and the wasting of their substance joyfully, but also to suffer death in its most horrid forms, knowing, not merely believing, that when this earthly house of their tabernacle was dissolved, they had a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5.1. All right. Thank you. Okay. So... He's talking about the ancient saints again, having the assurance that they were pursuing a course which is, was agreeable to the will of God. Do each of you have that assurance that the course you're pursuing is agreeable to the will of God? I'm just going to ask that question. Yeah, it's rhetorical. I want you to think about it. Do you have that assurance? I'm pretty assured personally that some of the things I do are not according, you know, on a course, uh, that are not pursuing a course agreeable to the will of God. Okay? trying to change that course, you know, but, and that's where I think most of us probably are. But if we sit down and really examine ourselves, we examine our motives, we examine the path we're on, and we examine some of the things that that we hold uh, to be true uh, in things that we're going to find and compare those to Scripture, I think we'll find those to be opposite, in opposition to the the, the path, the, uh, the course in which is agreeable to the will of God. Okay, and that's why I've you know I've suggested a few times take a look in a mirror, not literally, but take a look at yourself, and uh, and examine those things. Okay, when when you're you're thinking of something or thinking about doing something or or you know um, uh, just a routine you're in in life, you know, examine that routine. Think about those things. Is this okay? Is this a, you know first of all is this a course that is agreeable to the will of God? What is this showing other people? What is this showing my kids? Okay? 
as we all know, kids will, kids will catch you every time. You know, you tell them one thing and they'll catch you every time. Okay, they're they're not a do as I say, not as I do type of type of little guy, little person. Okay, and they will point it out to you too, and uh, it's not so comfortable a lot of times. So you know, think about that and examine yourselves. It takes a lot of examination, you know, and a lot of work, as Greg was talking about, to 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 get ourselves on that course. And then, if we're on that course, it still takes work to stay there. Okay, absolutely. Uh, and B, it goes back, uh, it says basically the same thing as, as uh, 2C. Uh, they were unable to take not only spoiling their goods and wasting their substance joyfully, but to also to suffer death in its most horrid form. Okay, you can see through this lecture that, that this idea is repeated time and time again. And they do that on purpose to get it stuck in our brains, to really force it in there and really get us to understand it, not just our brains, but our hearts. You know, like Mark Churchill was talking about last week. We get it into our hearts as an understanding. Okay? Questions or comments on three? All right, made, ready to move on? Let's do uh, four, uh, A through D, the whole thing. Someone read for us there? Eileen? Such was and always will be the situation of the saints of God, that unless they have an actual knowledge that the course that they are pursuing is according to the will of God, they will grow weary in their minds and faint. <clears throat> For such has been and always will be the opposition in the hearts of unbelievers and those that know not God against the pure and unadulterated religion of heaven, the only thing which ensures eternal life that they will pursue, they will persecute to the uttermost all that worship God according to his revelations. Receive the truth in love, in the, pardon me, receive the truth in the love of it, and submit, submit themselves to be guided and directed by his will, and drive them to such extremities that nothing short of an actual knowledge of their being the favorites of heaven and of their having embraced that order of things which God has established for the redemption of man will enable them to exercise that confidence in him necessary for them to overcome the world and obtain that crown of glory which is laid up for them that fear God. Okay, thank you, Eileen. All right, so uh, again, this, this takes that, that idea um, that we've been talking about in, in 2C and 3B and, and uh, how the ancients were, they had that knowledge, that understanding, and, and they were willing to uh, give up those things of the world to, to inherit uh, uh, the, the celestial glory of the other side, for their inheritance on the other side. So 4A, uh, the second paragraph, or second paragraph, second line about halfway through starts, unless they have an actual knowledge of the, that course that they are pursuing is according to the will of God, they will grow weary in their hearts and faint, or, or I'm sorry, in their minds and faint. Okay, think about that and what we talked about with the, uh, the parable of the seed thrown out, okay, and, and the, the stuff that lands on the, on the, the, the rocky soil spe specifically, okay. Th those were people who were trying to be saints. I'm, I'm going to give them the credit for that because that's probably what it was referring to. But uh, those were people trying to be saints, but they, they didn't have that knowledge that the course they were on was according to the will of God, and they grew weary, and they fainted from lack of nourishment, lack of, lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, whatever the case may be. They grew weary and fainted. Okay? Now, uh, remember, uh, salvation is a personal thing. Okay? It is up to us to seek out those things that, that will, will um, uh, nourish us and strengthen us. We cannot rely on other people. We can't rely on our spouses. We can't rely on... Uh, I hate to say this, but you can't rely on the priesthood. You can't put all your faith and trust in, and yeah, put, this is coming out wrong, but uh, don't, don't rely upon the arm of flesh because the priesthood is part of the arm of flesh. Not that we're trying to lie or lead you astray or anything like that. That's not my point. And, uh, but you can't just lean on somebody else is where I'm going with that and think that they are going to pull you into celestial glory, into the kingdom of God. Okay? It is up to you. You've got to open your books. You've got to study. You've got to pray. You've got to, uh, to uh, 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 look at your life and determine whether you're walking on the straight and narrow. 
according, obviously, according to the scriptures and things. And then from there, keep doing that. Okay? And the only thing you can rely upon, and I say thing for a purpose, is God. The only entity you can rely upon is God and the Godhead. Okay? Um, and something, something interesting I just caught here, uh, 4C. Okay? So uh, it's talking about... Um, sorry, I'm going to pause for something. Um, that we, we must be willing to do certain things. Okay? And one of those things is to receive the truth and the love of it. Okay, so if I, you know, if I see Karen, if you, I hope you don't mind me using you, yeah, it's nothing specific, but if I see Karen uh, walking along a certain path and, you know, in order for us to want to, to inherit celestial glory, inherit the kingdom of God, she must be willing for me to come to her and say, hey, Karen, I'm noticing this, hey, you know. We really need to probably work on some things. And I'd say it a little nicer usually, you know, but I'm just kind of trying to get this out there and say, well, you might want to think about going this way. Here's what the scriptures say and so on and so forth. You know, sometimes we do that with people and they get totally offended and don't judge me and yada, yada, yada and, and, and walk off. But if we're truly trying to be brothers and sisters, She's, she may not be happy at first, you know, because that's embarrassing, right? I mean, I'll admit it. People have done that with me, and it's pretty embarrassing. I might, my ire might get up, and, and, uh, but very soon I'm, I'm thinking about it and calming down and, and, and saying, you know what, thank you. Thank you very much for caring so much about me that you don't want to see me lost, right? Okay? <clears throat> Pardon me. My wife is very good at that with me. She is. It gets me angry. Because I don't like being wrong. <laughs> I hate being wrong. And uh, I hate it when somebody else notices I'm wrong, okay, and has to correct me. But I appreciate it, you know. I love her for it, absolutely. And it's uh, that, and, you know, when I try to point things out to her, usually I'm in the wrong for pointing it out because she's doing the right thing anyway. Um, and, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's supposed to be a back and forth, okay? And please don't take offense that I used you as an example. Uh, could have used Gail or anybody else. But, um, but that's what we're supposed to do. And, and with spouses, that, that is something that is expected, correct? Okay? Uh, it, but we, in this society that we're in right now, uh, that is not something that is, is expected and understood and even welcomed, you know, in most, most cases, Okay? But, you know, if you guys see something I'm doing wrong, please stop me and say something. I may not be happy about it. I won't yell and scream at you, I promise. I may go off and sulk for a while, maybe cry in the corner. But I, I, I do expect you to point it out, okay? And, but that's why we're here, right? Is because we are supposed to become very close like family to where we can have those conversations. That's what the family of God is all about. That's what becoming sons and daughters of God is all about. Okay, is reaching that spiritual maturity that we can take some constructive criticism because we're all trying to help each other out along this road. Make sense? Okay. So anyway, um, anybody, any questions on, on four there? Okay, but it's a willingness to listen is where I was going with that. And uh, we're going to stop there, I think, because uh, going on to the next one kind of ties into the rest of it. So... Let's stop there. We only got five minutes left anyway. Questions, comments, anything before we close up shop for the day? All right. Um, Kelly, you up for a prayer this time? No, still not? You have to do it one of these days, big guy. Okay. Uh, Wayne, would you mind offering a prayer to close us up? Our most wonderful creator, uh, one of the beautiful day of worship that you've given to us and even as we have gathered I praise and thank you for the uh, the gift of your scriptures the gift of knowledge the gift of uh, learning the ability to share together and the uh, as we've uh, been learning of your ways this morning together we know that each of us falls short in so many ways and so as we come this day I pray that we will come in anticipation of desire to worship desire to draw near to thee and that uh, you would guide and direct and bless, and that even as uh, we move forward into the uh, 11 o'clock hour, that you would bless our brother as he has prepared and came, and that we look forward to that 
message that he might bring that we each might be taught from on high and taught and pointed uh, towards thee and to uh, see the error of our ways lord we know that uh, we need thee and we uh, uh, so thank and praise thee for the gift of your son as he came in our place to the cross lord uh, bless us as we uh, worship this day that not our will but thy will be done in jesus name amen okay uh you know one thing since we do have a couple minutes um obviously there's only seven lectures in this and so we're getting close to the end here which my notes and uh so we're gonna need to talk about what we want to study next so um you know throw some things out there that have been suggested over the last you know, year and um uh, think about it and maybe next week we can talk about it a little more if I can remember to do that. Uh, one of the things was studying about Zion and the signs of the times. Uh, another is priesthood duties. Another was going through the rules and resolutions of the church. Uh, what are they and are they still applicable today? That sort, sort of thing. Done the lectures on faith. Um, the church in our nation's history and the connection with Jerusalem. Uh, going through the Book of Mormon verse by verse. Um, and talking about patterns, you know, as God has stated, He'll provide a pattern in all things, so we won't be deceived. Yeah, those are the, uh, yep, those are the ones. So, uh, those are the ones that have been suggested in the past. Think of other ones too, of course. If you got other topics, we can add them to the list. But out of those, I'd like to knock some of those out eventually as we go forth. So, if you can think about that, and we'll talk about it next week, and I'll make myself a note. All right. Um, when Sean's done in the back classroom, if we could have all the priesthood meet in the back corner classroom, we'd appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.